watching Over the Edge from Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. I'm back with Professor Abraham Loeb of Harvard University. And so we were thinking of propelling a, a, a spacecraft at a fifth of the speed of light such that uh, it would reach Proxima Centauri within 20 years. Uh, the star is about four light years away. So it will take 20 years to reach it at a fifth of the speed of light. And the question... How would you accelerate it to that, to that speed? That's a very good question, because uh, even with uh, nuclear fuel, uh, you don't have enough energy per unit mass to produce a rocket that will reach that speed. So, so the, there is a limiting speed that you can reach with, with a rocket which is dictated by the energy per unit mass of its fuel. You need a completely different technology that leaves the fuel behind. And one way to do it is by using a very powerful laser beam, a beam of light shining on a sail and pushing it through uh, the reflection of the light. So it's just like a, sail, a sailboat being pushed by wind. Here, the push is coming from uh, the reflection of light rather than the reflection of air molecules of the sail. And since light moves at the speed of light, you can in principle reach um, a fifth of the speed of light. For that, you need a laser as powerful as 100 gigawatt, which we don't have at the moment. Uh, and uh, you also need a very lightweight payload and sail uh, of the order of a few grams. And uh, if you go through the numbers, you find that with a few grams a sail and uh, a hundred gigawatt shining on it for about a few minutes, it can reach a, a fifth of the speed of light over a distance that is uh, about five times the distance to the moon. Now, you could never slow that probe down. It would just be a flyby, I assume? That's right. Uh, another point to keep in mind is uh, if such a civilization, if such a technology was developed by another civilization, we won't uh, notice those probes because they are so small, they don't reflect much sunlight, even if they pass close to the Earth. And they move so fast that uh, when astronomers look at the sky and they see something moving so fast, they immediately assume that it's a uh, cosmic ray or some, some other artifact. They, they don't even pay attention. Uh, and so... Such things may fly out through interstellar space we have and we wouldn't notice it with existing telescopes. Yeah, I, I, even if it was a full outright von Neumann probe or something like that. That's Well, I, sh I should say that uh, in that context that uh, there was uh, the first uh, object uh, that was discovered um, last year um, uh, that passed uh, through the solar system. Uh, oh, yes. Called Oumuamua. Well, <laughs> exactly. Yes. And, um, and surprisingly, this object appeared very elongated, uh, needle-like, uh, with uh, its width being just a, a tenth of its length, which um, resembles the kind of design we had in mind for the cruise phase of Starshot, when you want to minimize the cross-section of the uh, spacecraft such that um, it will not be damaged by impact of dust grains or, or interstellar atoms on its surface. And so uh, as soon as I heard about this, this object, I, <laughs> I um, uh, co contacted Yuri Milner and said, uh, you know, this is very peculiar. This object um, is very elongated and, you know, we should probably think about checking whether it has, it transmits any any signals. And, and we had a discussion about that and decided to look at it with Breakthrough Listen, the, the same uh, radio telescopes that are looking at other stars. And uh, the observations were able to put a limit of a, a less than a tenth of the transmission of a cell phone. Um, so in other words, uh, there is no radio um, transmission at, at the frequencies we looked at, uh, at a level that is less than a tenth of a, self, a single cell phone. The radio telescopes are so good these days that at the distance of Jupiter, they can put a limit on a tenth of a cell phone. Yeah, as I recall, they, there, was, <laughs> there was a story a few years ago where a microwave oven <laughs> inside of a lunchroom was actually coming across as a weird signal that might have been SETI-related, but it ended up just being the minor leakage from a microwave. Well, um, so, yeah, so in fact... Um, uh, that was related to another uh, phenomenon that is called fast radio bursts, um, which are um, very bright uh, bursts of flashes of radio waves um, coming from random directions in the sky. And, and the current estimate is that there are thousands of them or, 
or even uh, more than that, the fainter ones that we haven't detected yet, up to one per second uh, coming from the entire universe. Uh, thousands of them per day and maybe one per second of much fainter ones. Uh, but we don't really know conclusively where they come from. There is one that uh, seems to repeat and that allowed people to find it, locate it more precisely. And that one seems to originate in a dwarf galaxy, a small galaxy at a cosmological distance. Uh, but we don't know where most of them uh, come from. And uh, uh, in the spirit of being open-minded, uh, I wrote a paper with uh, my postdoc Manasvi Lingam on the possibility that we might be seeing a flash of uh, light that is associated with uh, light sail propulsion, with uh, the, the kind of signal you expect when a beam of light is crossing your line of sight. And, um, you know, the, if, if there is uh, another civilization using uh, uh, la laser propulsion or, or radio wave propulsion, um, then um, it, it focuses it to a very narrow beam pushing on the sail, but there is some leakage of the light uh, around the sail. And when that leakage, when that light um, crosses our view, it appears as a flash of light. Uh, the reason it, it moves across the sky is because the source is moving, we are moving, and so we see it only for an instant of time. And so we, we found out that potentially if there is a civilization that is harnessing all the radiation from its host star in the habitable zone of a sun-like star, uh, it could potentially produce, and it's using all of this energy that is impacting, uh, intercepting the surface of the, of the planet, uh, it's using it for propulsion uh, by beaming, uh, 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 producing a radio beam uh, that is pushing on a sail, then uh, even at cosmological distances, uh, that could be detectable as a fast radio burst. And uh, although, you know, unlikely, this is a possibility that uh, should be kept in mind, uh, the most popular explanation that people have, that astronomers, mainstream astronomers have, is that these flashes of, of radio waves originate from uh, newly born neutron stars. Neutron stars are the end result of the collapse of a massive star um, that weighs uh, uh, somewhere between 8 to uh, 30 times the mass of the sun. Uh, when it collapses, the core of the star makes uh, a dense uh, object uh, that is just like an atomic nucleus. It has, uh, but it has um, the mass of the sun roughly and the size of a city, uh, about 10 kilometers, 12 kilometers. Um, and um, such a dense object is called a neutron star. And uh, when it's born, if it has strong magnetic fields, it's so compact that it can produce very bright uh, flashes of um, radio waves. We see much fainter flashes of radio waves uh, from pulsars. These are neutron stars that are spinning and repeating um, periodically, uh, like lighthouses. Um, but uh, these are usually fainter by a billion times fainter than, um, uh, than the fast radio bursts. So, in fact, if the fast radio bursts are originated cosmological distances, if one of them happened to take place in our galaxy, we would be able to detect it with a, a cell phone. Uh, it would be so bright, a billion times brighter than a single pulsar. Now, if you... Um, back to fast radio bursts for a moment. Now, are there differences between fast radio bursts? Are they, all, are they different from each other? Are there different classes? Uh, is there a way to tell whether one might be of artificial origin? Well, the thing is, we, we have hundreds of repetitions of that one repeater that I mentioned. We haven't seen another repeater as of yet. Uh, that could be a class of its own. Uh, most of the others do not repeat, and people are searching for repeaters, so they have some limits. Um, each, FR, each fast radio burst is different uh, from another, uh, but the differences may also be related to the medium that the, the burst passes through, because 
uh, it gets delayed by uh, the, the gas, uh, the ionized gas, the, the free electrons um, along the path to the source. Um, um, nevertheless, you know, I, I, you know, it could be that they come from a mix of sources and that a small fraction of them are artificially produced. Uh, and, you know, we, we should just keep collecting data. And with future radio telescopes, we will be able to get a much higher fidelity data. Uh, I'm just waiting for the one fast radio burst that will take place in our own galaxy, because that would be a billion times brighter than those that come from cosmological distances. You know, and uh, we could learn a lot about uh, its origin. If it were too close, would it be dangerous? No, <laughs> these are radio waves. Um, so, as I said, it's something that is detectable with a cell phone, and that means that such uh, intensity is going through our bodies at all times. Um, uh, it's nothing much stronger than that. I mean, in terms of, if you ask about the risks um, for life, um, the, the the biggest risks uh, for life from astrophysical sources um, on Earth. Uh, is coming from asteroid impacts. Um, you know, every now and then an asteroid impacts the Earth, and, and there are so-called the killer asteroids that are big enough that could, uh, just like they killed the, the dinosaurs, uh, can can kill us. And uh, there is a program to monitor all these potential, all, all these asteroids that could potentially uh, cross the orbit of the Earth. And by now we mapped uh, uh, most of, you know, a large fraction of them. Uh, that are very big, uh, but you know, as you go to smaller sizes, are, it's more challenging to detect them at great distances. So, we we don't have a full census, uh, but that's the biggest risk. Uh, then there is a risk from the sun itself. Um, the sun has flares, and there was a giant flare back about um, uh, a century and a half ago um, that is called the Carrington uh, event. Uh, back then, we didn't have technology the way we have right now and so that flare didn't bother anyone uh, humans uh, had a rather uh, primitive uh, lifestyle back then if it would have happened today it would have caused damage uh, damage at the level of um, a few trillion dollars um, and um, simply because of the infrastructure that we have right now if we haven't if we were if we need if we do not uh, protect it, uh, it could have damaged uh, a lot of our power grid and uh, satellites and so forth. There, there is a lot of real estate that is vulnerable to, to a powerful solar flare of the type that just took place uh, a century and a half ago. Uh, and so I actually wrote a paper with uh, Manasvi again uh, on the risks from uh, solar flares for our technology and, and the risk, uh, the financial risk grows with time because we are becoming more dependent on technology and, and the, the more sophisticated our technology is, the infrastructure is, the more uh, damaging would the solar flare be. Uh, there is also potential risk of life uh, because, you know, the Carrington event changed the temperature by uh, several degrees uh, when it happened and uh, it also destroyed the, some of the ozone uh, in the atmosphere at a noticeable level uh, by a few percent. So, so if there is something more powerful than that, which could happen every thousand years or every 10,000 years, that could have some uh, repercussions for, for life on Earth. And of course, that's the reason why living next to a dwarf star is more risky, because those stars flare much more often than the sun. And then, and then finally, in terms of physical risks, there is a possibility that the star will explode next to us, uh, called a supernova. That's the process that makes neutron stars. But uh, the risk from that uh, is not great. Um, uh, in fact, uh, it's not clear that uh, we, we should worry about it for, for the age of the universe, uh, for that being... Uh, uh, affecting life on Earth um, at all. Uh, I wrote a paper about that uh, as well. Um, and so um, so these are the astrophysical risks. The, there is also a potential risk from the black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy flaring up. Uh, again, not very likely to affect us. We are far enough away. If uh, the Earth was much closer to the galactic center uh, by a factor of 10 or more, uh, then uh, such a flare could have 
affected it. So, so in fact, the, 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 new, uh, the inner regions of galaxies are vulnerable. They can be sterilized by the black hole at the center flaring up and producing a lot of ultraviolet radiation that uh, sterilizes the planets close to it. That was a bit of material that went over the edge. A bonus clip from a full episode of Event Horizon. New episodes every Thursday. So do be sure to hit subscribe. The full episode should be on your screen right about now.